Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Welcome to the Connecting the Dots podcast with Dr. Wilmer Leon. I'm Wilmer Leon. Please forgive the hat. I was supposed to go to the barbershop today and get a haircut, and I didn't. So please forgive the hat, but you do not want to see this crazy head of hair. Here's the point. We have a tendency to view current events as though they happen in a vacuum, failing to understand the broader historical context in which most events take place. During each episode, my guests and I have probing, provocative, and in-depth conversations that connect the dots between the current events and the broader historic context in which they occur. This enables you to better understand and analyze the events that impact the global village in which we live. On today's episode, the issue before us is, how long can the United States and the Biden administration continue to support genocide in occupied Palestine? My guest is a Mint Press News contributing writer, published author, and human rights activist, born in Jerusalem. His latest books are The General's Son, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine, and Injustice, the story of the Holy Land Foundation Five. Miko Pellet, my brother, welcome to the show. Good to be with you. Thank you. Let's let's start with um with with the with some of the current events and, and work back. Uh the un, the the UN Security Council demanded an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, and the US abstained from the vote, and Israel was incredibly, incredibly angry that the United States did not vote no on this. Talk about the significance of that. Well, you know, it's the it's the tail wagging the dog. It's, that's really what this is. Somehow the Israel uh, feels, and rightfully so, that on on and, and any anything that has to do with with uh, U.S. policy regarding the Middle East, regarding Iran, regarding the Arab world. Israel needs to call the shots. And so if Israel wants America to veto, America vetoes. If Israel doesn't want America to veto, it doesn't veto. Uh, And it's happened now, and it happened, I think, once or twice before, where America abstained, where Israel wanted it to veto. So now Israel is, uh, and the Israeli prime minister are, um, you know, are are having a tantrum. They're they're, they're like, you know, in, in the middle of a tantrum right now, anger tantrum. How dare the United States not obey the orders of the uh, how the dog dare not obey the tail. Uh, that's that's really what it's all about. That's what we're seeing. So how how do we now really reconcile? Because we're hearing now that the 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 relationship there are all these great tensions between Netanyahu and Biden, and uh, Netanyahu now is not allowing the defense ministers, I think, that were supposed to come to Washington to have a meeting. They're not coming. and But at the same time, Palestinians continue to die. Palestinians continue to starve. Bombs continue to be dropped. So on the ground, there does not seem to be any significant shift in the reality. It's the, it's the rhetoric that has changed at this point. Look, you're confusing what's important with what is not important, okay? Palestinians dying, starving, and and, and all that is is, is immaterial. They're not Europeans, they're not white, they're not Christians, most of them. uh, It's really immaterial. What's important is that Israel is satisfied. What's important that that the Israeli different lobby groups, uh, Zionist groups in America are happy. What's important is that uh, the Biden administration, Congress, uh, all the different school boards around the country, uh, chiefs of police, toe the line. That's what's important now. And there seems to be like that. There might be a little tiny bit of a shift in this wall of support, that this is massive support that Israel has in the United States. It's a very small shift, mind you. It's nothing major. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is the important story. The fact that uh, tens of thousands of innocent people are being murdered, um, and not only does America not try to stop it, do nothing nothing to stop it. Not only are they selling weapons, they are negotiating, they're allowing the perpetrator of this mass slaughter of innocent civilians, um, 
you know, uh, determine the terms upon which they may or may not agree to stop the killing. So there's no precondition for them to stop the killing while the negotiations are taking place. It's an absurd reality of, of, of a kind that is, that is really, I, I, think, I think the only way, the only way we can understand just how absurd this is, is to try to imagine that um, while millions of people were being slaughtered during World War II by the Nazis, that the world would wait for the Nazis to agree to the terms of a ceasefire, supply them with the means to continue the genocide, uh, and then just let them, you know, wait for them to agree while people were being slaughtered. I think that is really the, the only appropriate uh, kind of comparison here to, sh to demonstrate just how grotesquely absurd the reality is right now. So in terms of negotiation, the there was a, a group of, uh, of uh, Israeli government representatives and Hamas representatives in Qatar. And when the United States failed to uh, veto the ceasefire resolution, uh, Israel threw a fit. And the reporting is they withdrew from the negotiations, but left a few people behind yeah. to continue negotiations. Some people have said to me that what this really represents is Hamas right now has the upper hand and that Israel is losing or realizes that it's damn near lost this war and that they're trying to find some way to extract some safe uh, face saving element from this your thoughts you know i don't know i'm not sure i'm not sure that i would categorize it quite like that okay. um israel is achieving everything it wants to achieve you know tens of thousands of palestinians dead is a good thing for israel this is an accomplishment mm -hmm. um you know over a million close you know a million and a half starving homeless people uh famine Basically, this this entire logjam taking place around the Gaza Strip, the fighting going on. You know, the Palestinian fighters in Gaza are still fighting, so it shows. You know, it gives Israel an opportunity to still you know utilize its um, its army. Uh, there's no downside here for Israel. Israel does not has no motivation to end this. The more Palestinians die, the more Palestinians suffer. Um, the happier Israelis seem to be, uh, the happier Netanyahu seems to be. And this is really the, the goal of this whole thing. The goal of this whole thing was not to achieve some kind of a military objective or political objective. It was to slaughter people. And the slaughter is, is allowed to continue. The, uh, it, uh, the United States is, is supplying all the arms that Israel needs to slaughter these people. And so for Israel, this is all upside. I don't know why they, you know, the, the people have the impression that Israel wouldn't be happy. They're very happy. And the fact that the negotiations are not working, the fact that, first of all, the fact that anybody's negotiating with Israel is absurd. But the fact that not only is Israel showing up, but it can leave the negotiations because it's unhappy. Uh, again, this is all upside for Israel. I don't see, I don't see anything down, any, any downside here as far as Israel is concerned. On the 7th of October, I think it was, Hassan Nasrallah from uh, from Hamas said, we weren't... We, I'm sorry? He's oh, Hez leader, Hezbollah. Hezbollah, I'm sorry. Not Hamas, Hezbollah. Thank you. Um, uh, he said in his speech, we weren't in it on October 6th, but we're in it on October 8th. And many have been waiting for Hezbollah to get more involved. Folks have been waiting, I believe, for for Syria to get more involved. Um, do you see that on the horizon? Um, but people have been waiting for Iran to get more involved. Do you see that on the horizon, or are the Palestinians, to a great degree, being left hung out to dry? The Palestinians? No, it's not a question of them being left hung out to dry. But I think it was very clear from the very beginning this is not going to be a regional war. Um, I think it was several weeks into into uh, into this 
where there was this much anticipated speech by uh, Nasrallah. I happened to be in Jordan at the time and, you know, the streets were empty. Shops were closed. Everybody was glued to the radios and to the TVs to hear what he was going to say. And he made it absolutely clear this was a local issue. This was not a regional war. So nobody's going to intervene. And I think it was it was obvious from the very beginning that militarily nobody's going to intervene. That's not what this is about. Um, and and when you come to think of it, I think it's probably the responsible, the responsible uh, approach. We do know that the Yemeni forces are closing the Straits of Bab el-Mandab to, you mm -hmm. know, are disrupting the, the naval commerce, you know, commerce going through the Suez Canal, which, of course, is a responsible thing to do. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think this is, we're not going to see any, any of that sort of, we're not going to see that kind of scenario play out in any way, shape or form. What I think we should be demanding is that the government, this government, the U.S. government, uh, be held accountable uh, and stop talking about a ceasefire and, and begging Israel to agree to a ceasefire and negotiating or allowing Israel to negotiate. The Sixth Fleet is in the Mediterranean. The Sixth Fleet should follow the example of the Yemeni forces and, and place a, a, a naval blockade against Israel, provide humanitarian aid to the Palestinians in Gaza, and impose an arms embargo on Israel. That's really the only thing that, uh, that's what we need to be talking about. That's what we need to be demanding of our government. But I don't think there's a realistic expectation that uh, you know, either the Arabs or the Iranians or anybody else uh, would get into this militarily. So there's a lot of discussion about Israel going into Rafah. If, if you could talk about that, and I can't remember who it was, but I, I remember somebody telling me that because of the specific geography of that space and now the number of people that are in that space, that this will be worse than what we've seen up to this point. If that's even possible. You know, I don't know if that's possible. I mean, I don't know what worse means. You know, the numbers are indicating over 30,000 people murdered, which means realistically probably closer to 50,000. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that were fortunate enough to die immediately. Then you've got God knows, only knows how many tens of thousands that are dying of their wounds, dying of, of starvation, dying of fat, disease, dying, of, you, know, and so, you know, under the rubble, suffocating to death. Mm -hmm. I, it's going to be more of the same. I mean... Unless there is an absolute force that force that, that places pressure on Israel to stop, there's going to be more. There's going to be another Rafah. Now they focus on Shifa Hospital. Then they focus on this. Then they focus on that. There's always something that everybody's focused on. The bottom line is the genocide of the Palestinian people is an ongoing process. Unless the perpetrators of the genocide are forced to end it they will not end i mean again I, I you know i know i've never done this i've never used these comparisons before ever at all in speaking but in this particular case i think the appropriate comparison is to hitler and the nazis you know the, the, unless if the nazis were not stopped by force mm -hmm. then there would be a lot more millions more dead in europe i mean i don't think there's any question about that and Israel is the same. Unless it is forced to stop the killing, to end the genocide, there will be tens of thousands more, uh, hundreds of thousands perhaps, dead Palestinians. I understand the reluctance to use that Nazi comparison. I know, I understand the, the reluctance to use a Hitler comparison, but it seems to be fitting in this context and this is a question that a lot of people wonder, but because of the threat of being accused of being anti-Semitic, uh, people don't want to ask. And that is, how can a people that experienced what they experienced during the Holocaust now do exactly the same thing to another group of people? Well, that's a question that is asked a lot. And the, and the answer is it's not the same people. Very few survivors of the of the Holocaust ended up in what became Israel, ended up going to Palestine. Mm -hmm. Many of those that did go there left because they couldn't stand the, this militaristic, racist uh, state that was established there. 
Um, and so it's not the same people. The Zionists had planned the, the genocide and ethnic cleansing in Palestine years before the Holocaust. And the perpetrators of the ethnic cleansing and the genocide are not survivors of anything. These are these are Israeli. These are Zionist colonizers. And so uh, it's 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 it, it does a disservice to the survivors of the Holocaust, who had nothing to do with perpetrating these crimes. Uh, and it's historically untrue. These are not the same people. Just the, just because these happen to be Jewish people and these happen to be Jewish people, you mm -hmm. know, it's not the same Jewish people. And as a matter of fact, there were many uh, survivors of the Holocaust who stood up very firmly and opposed Zionism and opposed the, 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 the crimes of the Zionists. Uh, many of them, unfortunately, have passed on, but some of them are still alive and are fighting and speaking out. And many of their descendants. I mean, you know, uh, you you've spoken to uh, Rabbi Weiss and others from, you know, the ultra orthodox, and that mm -hmm. entire community are Hungarian Jews. Their their families perished in the Holocaust, and nobody stands more firmly against Zionism and the crimes of Zionists than they do. And they know firsthand about the Holocaust. They know firsthand of you know they know the names of the relatives that were that, that were murdered uh, during the Holocaust. And so, um, and so, I, I know this 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 question comes up a lot, but uh, but mm -hmm. it's but it's it's not the same people. And elaborate, if you would please, on the point that uh, Zionism and anti-Semitism are not the same thing. That the Zionists, Joe Biden, is an admitted, self-admitted Zionist. Not all Jews are Zionists. Not all Zionists are Jews. And so, if you could, because that whole narrative and that mythology is starting to unravel and uh, uh, people are now coming to understand that this is a Zionist issue. This is not a Jewish issue. If you could unpack a little bit of that. Uh, sure. So that narrative, please. You know, as, as, as people know, you know, Jews are a, a religious minority that exists everywhere, you know, throughout the countries of the, of the world. They, uh, they have uh, for us, you know, since time immemorial. Um, the Zionists picked on an idea which originally was not a Jewish idea. It was a, a, uh, a Christian evangelist idea, which is that the Jews are not just a religious minority. They are part of a nation and they are descendants of the ancient Hebrews. And therefore, in order for there to be a second coming of Christ or something, the Jews have to return to their ancestral homeland. The Zionists, who later established the Zionist movement, who were secular Jews who wanted nothing to do with Judaism. They were completely secular. They, they wanted to have nothing to do with, with, religion, with religion or with Judaism or with Jews who were religious picked up on that and said, well, maybe this is something we should build on. And they built on this idea, which, by the way, contravenes Jewish law, because Jewish law prohibits Jews from sovereignty in the Holy Land. I'll say that again. Jewish law, Jews, according to Jewish law, according to their own religion, are prohibited from sovereignty in the Holy Land. Now, the Zionists, having been completely secular and had completely dis total disregard, if not contempt, for religion, Particularly the Jewish religion uh, decided that you know they would they would uh, adopt this idea that they named Zionism, which today we know as Zionism, which is a settler colonial idea, which was uh, to create a European a Jewish European uh, colony, kind of in, in in Palestine. And since we were talking about Europeans taking over the land of people who are not Europeans, white people who are taking over the lands of people who are not white, the world around, you know, applauded this and the British applauded it and the Americans applauded it and others applauded it and supported them and, and so on. So this is what Zionism is. It's a racist settler colonial ideology. It's violent. It, produ it produced a militaristic violent state, an apartheid state, which is known as the state of Israel. And, uh, and for the last 70, you know, six, seven years, it has been engaged in three, not one, not two, but three crimes against humanity. And these crimes, these crimes were initiated only three years after the end of the Holocaust. And these crimes are genocide, 
the definition of which as a, as a, as a law was established after as a result of, of to a large degree as a result of the genocide of the Jews in Europe, the crime of ethnic cleansing and the crime of apartheid. So three years after the world made this effort to fight and defeat the Nazis and end the genocide of Jews and so many others by the Nazis, they allowed, the world allowed the Zionists to embark on genocide and of the genocide in Palestine. And that is what we're seeing today. So certainly today the numbers are very, very high. The violence is extreme. Um, but it's not unique. It is part of something that's been going on for a very long time. It's just now people are paying attention because it is so extreme. At what point in, well, before I get there, let me ask you, let me ask you, so, so people can understand uh, your history, born in Jerusalem, your book, The General's Son, your father uh, is a, is a historic uh, Israeli general. Your grandfather signed the Israeli, uh, uh, Constitution, Declaration of Independence. Declaration yes. of Independence. Yeah, yes, I come from I come from a you know I, I think we and I had this conversation before. I didn't learn about Zionism in a in a college course or in a textbook. I I learned Zionism at the dinner table, uh, you know, with my mother's milk, if you will. You know, my my family were all deep, deeply patriotic Zionists. They believed they were true believers. They were zealots, if you will. Every conversation around the dinner table, every conversation at family gatherings was about Zionism and how do we further the cause of Zionism and what can we do more for Zionism and how do we contribute to the state and the state, the state, the state, the Jewish state, the Zionist state was the most important thing in, in every conversation, in every conversation, whether it was a military, military conversation, whether it was political conversation, whether it was a cultural conversation, whether it's how do we get countries around the world to support us more and all of that sort of thing. This was everything. So that's where I come from. I, I, I heard these conversations, you know, every single day growing up. And, uh, and of course, it was very difficult for me to make the transition and to realize what. And it was, also, it was also reinforced in school. It was reinforced in school. It was reinforced in the media. It was reinforced in, in, in culture and literature. It was reinforced in, in popular culture, in everything. The dehumanization of Palestinians was taught in schools similar to apartheid in South Africa. Yes, it was a lot more subtle, actually, but it okay. was very, very effective. So you thought you were learning about human right, humanity and liberal ideals and that sort of thing in terms of human rights and people's rights and, and so forth. Um, and uh, we learned to admire Nelson Mandela and, 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 and MLK and so on. At the same time, we were perpetrators of these horrific crimes. But because the segregation is so effective, because Israelis, and again, we're talking about a very small country, because Israelis live and exist in spheres that are completely, for lack of a, of a better word, cleansed of the other, the segregation is so absolute, so complete, there's no connection. There's no sense that we're causing an injustice because everything, the only thing we know about the other is what we're hearing from our own environment. It's so insular. It's completely insular, very insular. And so you can have, you know, you can see when you're on the beach in Tel Aviv, you know, and Tel Aviv is known for its beaches, its bars, its restaurant, it's this happy Mediterranean city, you know, um, and when they bomb Gaza, you see the smoke. You can hear the bombing. Now, there's never been a military in Gaza. There's no, Palestinians never had an army. Palestinians never had a tank. At best, they've had small groups of, of resistance fighters, many of them in flip-flops and jeans, uh, carrying a, a, a you know, semi-automatic with a handful of bullets. That's it. So that's a Palestinian, that's a Palestinian military, uh, in the scope of the Palestinian military. So how can you exist so close to a genocide, not to mention the fact that my, you know, my generation, our, our fathers and mothers participated in these horrific crimes upon which the state of Israel was established, and we're proud of it. And you can see today on YouTube, you can see, um, you know, there's, there's lots of footage of that older generation, the generation of my father who was still alive or, or before they passed, they were interviewed, and they talk about the murder, the rape, the pillaging, the burning of villages, the mass killings, and so on. 
as though, and, and their whole thing is, they, the way they describe it is, well, what, we had no choice. What else could we do? I mean, if we didn't do it to them, we wouldn't be where we are, which is true. But it was, you know, they, they justify it. So that's, again, that's where, that, that's where I come from. And, and, and the, the, ingenu- the ingenuity of the system is that you can live so close to the other, yet not see the other, and then kill the other with a sense of impunity, with a sense of righteousness, even. Your father is attributed with developing or at least articulating the concept of a two state of the two state solution, isn't that yeah. is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. Immediately after the 1967 war, where Israel took the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, uh, he was one of the generals who, who orchestrated and, and then executed this war, which people consider so heroic that it's, you know, some people call it a miracle, which of course none of that is true. And I talk about it in detail in my book in the general mm-hmm. Sun. As soon as it was over, he stood up still in uniform, literally the last, you know, the, the last day of the war, the first meeting of the Israeli high command. He said, well, now we have a chance to make peace. Let's allow the Palestinians to have a state in these newly occupied territories, the West Bank of Gaza give back the other territories that we occupied from the Syrians and the and Egyptians, and then we can have peace. And he was taken aside by, you know, his Hakrabin and others who are his, you know, the other the other generals and said, what are you talking about? Why would we do that? We're strong. We, it's all ours now. And he said, well, because if we don't, we're going to end up, you know, with, with, this, with this catastrophe, something that's not going to work. You know, everything we, we accomplish is going to be lost. Uh, not so quite. anyways, so so he he did, and then and then he retired a year later, and the rest of his life he dedicated. He did. He died in 1995. The rest of his life he dedicated to this idea of a Palestinian-Israeli peace based on the two-state solution, as the Israeli establishment made it absolutely clear that was never going to happen, and did everything they possibly could to make sure that it would never happen by building for Jews only in the West Bank and and so on and so forth. So that, that 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 is true. He was one of the he was he was probably one of the earliest people who talked about this concept of a two state solution. And your father was a was a linguist. Uh, after he left the he was it uh, he, Arab he, literature uh, and language and language he, Arabic literature was his Arabic literature was his uh, was his topic, and so he taught Arabic literature in in uh, universities and in, in, in Israeli universities. Yes, it was linguist. He was uh, it was Arabic literature was his uh, forte, and he spoke and, and read, and you know he was completely literate in Arabic. So, how does a Israeli general that was as committed to the state of Israel as your father was, the son of a signatory to the Declaration of Independence? And now you, as their son slash grandson, move beyond the Zionism and the racism and the apartheid to the work that you do now. Well, Where's, how's that? Talk about that transformation in your in your life, in your reality. Well, when my father was asked about this. You know, how could a man who was so such a hawk, as a general, he was known as a hawk, he pushed for war, he pushed for conquest, suddenly turn around and he said, well, uh, there's no turnaround. The most important strategic objective for Israel at one point was war, at another point it was peace. And so as far as he was concerned, he thought, well, we created this Jewish state. Granted, we want all of the, you know, the land of Israel, but we can't have it because we want to live in peace, so we need to compromise. Uh, he was deeply interested in literature. He was deeply interested in, in, in Arabic literature. He wanted to know about the, the neighborhood in which he was, you know, he and others established a state. And so to him, it made perfect sense. Um, where I think he was misguided, naive, I'm not quite sure or what, is that he thought that racism and violence can stop at a certain point. And the problem with racism and violence, the problem with settler colonialism is that it has an insatiable appetite. And so there was no way Zionism was going to end at a particular border. You know, the Zionism is a zero sum game. The entire country belongs to us. Nobody else matters. There's no room for compromise. And he, you know, he was a, he was a, he was a highly regarded general. He was a highly regarded person in general. 
Um, and so he's he a became, historic figure in Israel. And then he became a traitor. He was an outcast. And so because he suggested compromise, so, you know, moving forward all these years later, I uh, began engaging in this and became an activist and so on. And I remember the moment where I looked around me, I was in Palestine, and I, and I realized that two-state solution is a lie. It was always a lie. There was no chance whatsoever for it ever to be uh, material, to, material, to, 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 to materialize because Zionism is a zero-sum game. Because the, the reality that Israel created in Palestine does not allow for compromise, unless Palestinians, you know, go down on their knees and completely surrender or die. Israel that's capitulation. Compromise. That's not compromise. Exactly. And that's exactly what Israel was, was wanted, capitulation. And it's interesting that you use that word because there's a great Palestinian writer by the name of Hassan Kanafani. And uh, he was assassinated by the Israelis in 72 in, 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 uh, in Lebanon, in Beirut. He and his 16-year-old niece were killed in a car bomb that the Israelis placed, put in his car. And there's an interview with him, which I strongly recommend. It's, 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 you can find it everywhere, but it's on YouTube, where he is questioned. This is 1971, maybe, or something like that. And he's questioned by an Australian uh, journalist why won't you, why are you opposed to making peace with the Israelis? And he looks at him kind of and says, you don't actually mean peace, you mean capitulation. And he uses that word. Mm -hmm. You mean capitulation. And the, and the reporter kind of pushes and says, well, why not negotiate? He goes, well, he said, that would be a very strange kind of negotiation. It would be like negotiations between the sword and the neck. And he made this point very clear, and he was tr and he was right, and history has proven him right. And sadly, he was thirty six, I think, when he was assassinated. He's a prolific writer. He's written, you know, incredible work, and I strongly recommend people look up and read his uh, his stories, his short stories against Hassan Kanafani. And um, but he used the word capitulation because that is the intent of the Zionists from the very beginning: ethnic cleansing until they capitulate, and then it's all ours. And I, if you heard uh, Jared Kushner speak about the wonderful beachfront property. That was one of my next questions. Go ahead, please. In the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. and that's what this is about. It's about getting rid of these brown people so that we can enjoy this beachfront property. And that's exactly the point. We want to get rid of these other people so that we, the settlers, can have it. And you'd think, you know, Palestinians have known and enjoyed this beachfront property for thousands of years. Now suddenly you want them, you think that they don't know that this is wonderful property. They enjoy the beaches. They have homes. They have restaurants and cafes and hotels, just like anybody, any other nation enjoying their beachfront property. You know, Gaza used to be known for, before the destruction that Israel brought in 1948, for its beautiful dunes, beautiful beaches, wonderful seafood, um, magnificent views, the fragrance of the citrus trees that grow there, you know, in the, and I mean, that's what Gaza is known for. Wealth, commerce, many education institutions, universities and so on. That's what Gaza was known for. So now Jared Kushner finally found out, discovered that this is beach property. So he thinks the Jews, white Jews need, are the ones who need to develop it and enjoy it. And he even used a term similar to the final solution or something like that, which mm -hmm. again, reminds us of the Nazis. But uh, that's exactly the point. They want it all, and they want it for themselves. Chuck Schumer, Senator Chuck Schumer, in the well of the Senate, gave a very impassioned speech a couple weeks ago where he called for Benjamin Netanyahu to step aside. And he, many in the West, praise Chuck Schumer for taking such a principled stand. He didn't call for a ceasefire. He didn't, he didn't call for an end to the conflict. He, in fact, he said, when this eventually ends, and Netanyahu accused him of interfering in Israeli politics. 
was that Chuck Schumer really just either reading the handwriting on the wall that Netanyahu's got to go, and when you replace him, chances are you're going to get somebody that's even more extreme than he is, uh, like what uh, um, Smotrich? Is it Smotrich or Gantz? Which um, Gantz is well, no, nobody's nobody can take his place. I mean, it's 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 this is just this is this is just talk. There's no one who can take Netanyahu's place. And so, uh, but there, there are several candidates, and who knows what what Israeli but, politics. Okay. But, but, but my, my point, my point, the guy, in the, the guy. My, my point in, in the question is um, that for for net for Netanyahu for for Schumer, I get it confused. Yeah. To, yeah um, to call for new elections, chances are because of the coalition that Netanyahu had to form. He had to move hard right in order harder right in order to formulate his government. It's only going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Well, I think Chuck Schumer doesn't give a damn uh, one way or the other. But there's so much. There's a lot of pressure in the Democratic Party for the for for the people who represent the Democratic Party in important positions to speak up. And so Chuck Schumer, I, I think he was feeling the pressure, and he. He had to say something, so he said something that, like you say, is completely irrelevant. Well, in the words of that of that brilliant African American philosopher James Brown, he was talking loud and saying nothing. Yeah, and being a being a career politician, and you know, I think he was probably born in the Senate, um, if not conceived. That he, uh, you know, he's uh, he, this is what he does. That's what he does for a living. You know, I, I think he's been in the Senate, or maybe he was in the Congress before that. But I mean, he was a politician his whole life. That's what it's all about. It's talking and talking and talking and saying absolutely nothing of any significance. Now, let's. Uh, Netanyahu created a, a, a situation where there's there's no opposition. So let's say the, let's say Israelis went to now. There's no reason for Israelis to go to the to elections because it hasn't been four years since the previous elections, and the government is strong, and it has a as long as they have a majority in the House of Representatives, because it's a parliamentary system. As long as they have a majority, they don't need to go for elections. Mm -hmm. And they have a very strong, he has a safe majority. That's why, if anybody remembers of last year, there were all these massive protests against Netanyahu. But this was from the people, the, the 45%, not the 55%. So he didn't care. They could protest as long as they want. He was safe. Mm -hmm. And so because he's so safe, there's no reason for elections. And let's say there were elections. He's still the only guy who can form a coalition. He's the only one who can form a coalition. He's the best at it. And and uh, and he has no qualms about who he sits with. And ideologically, you know, I don't think he has a problem sitting with these right-wing, uh, you know, neo-Nazi Jews because he agrees with them ideologically. They have a different take on it because they kind of put a kind of a religious spin on it. So they wear the kippahs and they pretend to pray and so forth. But the, they're arguing the, over process, not ideology. Yeah, exactly. And and not even process. I mean, he's very happy to see what is happening in Gaza. This is all, like I said earlier, this is all for, for, for him, for Israeli politicians, and even for the public. This is, you know, this is all up. There's no downside. There has been talk. We, we were talking about Israel going into Rafah. There's been talk also about Israel going back into Lebanon. Um, do you see that as a, as a realistic option? And because I would think if they tried it again, they'd meet the same fate. Well, they're not going to they're not going to put boots on the ground. That's for sure because Hezbollah taught them a lesson, and uh, and we see it in Gaza too. I mean, when they you know as soon as they started putting boots on the I didn't I didn't think they would, but as soon as they did put boots on the ground in Gaza, they're heavy heavy casualties, mm -hmm. heavy casualties, and. More than any time in, within the history of Israel, we see the number of high-ranking officers mm -hmm. uh, among the casualties much higher than we've ever seen before. In much fact, from what, I, from what I understand, um, before the 7th of October, the average age of an Israeli, um, I think, say from captain on up, was like 46 years old. And now it's down to almost 30. It could be. It could okay. be. There are many, many high-ranking officers and commanders of units, commanders of brigade commanders and so on, 
that have been killed. So they're, they're paying a heavy price. So they're not going to do, I don't believe they're going to do, make that same. Now, there was a reason to do this in Gaza. I think the Israeli government wants these casualties. It helps morale. It helps unify the country, you know, and so on. Um, to do this again in Lebanon, that's a whole other story. Israelis are still, I think, traumatized from what happened in Lebanon in the past. So the only other option would be to bomb Lebanon from the air. And again, create this catastrophe of refugees, and I think it's just that's too much even for even for Israel to handle. So I don't think I don't think there's going to be uh, an invasion uh, or, or or war in Lebanon. Okay, like I said earlier, I, I don't think that this is not leading to a uh, this is not going to lead to a, um, a regional war. This may sound a bit sophomoric, but I think it is a a, a, a worthwhile question to ask. Uh, so. South Africa and some other countries bring a case against Israel to the world court. The United States opposes the process. Also, uh, once the decision was rendered, the, the United States opposed the decision. This most recent vote in the UN, Linda Thomas Greenfield, somebody finally whispered in her ear and said, keep your hand down, don't vote yes. Um, what do you see as being the change in that dynamic? What brought about this most recent uh, action by the United States? There's a lot of pressure. Look, there's a lot of pressure today on the Biden administration. There's a lot, you know, people are angry in the State Department. People are angry in the White House. People in Michigan are really pissed. People in Michigan are very, very pissed. I think uh, Joe Biden is, uh, is in a very, very dangerous position politically which means the Democratic Party is in a very dangerous, mm -hmm. very precarious, I should say, uh, position. And so, again, that's why we suddenly see Chuck Schumer say something. And then we see this uh, in the UN, we see some changes. And that, But this is nothing significant. This is just mm -hmm. an attempt to kind of uh, temper the uh, and, and, uh, and kind of calm down the voices that are angry. I don't think it's going to do the job. I think the anger is real. The frustration is real. Um, but this is just mar these, you know these are changes in the margins mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and i know your time is short with me and i i greatly appreciate you squeezing me in um so what happens now what uh, your your thoughts on on over the next few weeks what what happens over the next year that depends on us. If we act then and we start to change the conversation in Washington, then things can, then this can end. If we don't, it won't. Look, the, the, I, th Does I think the that, Trump administration make a difference? Not for the better. <laughs> you know, I don't think it's about an administration. It's about, right. it's about. It's American foreign policy. It's not just American foreign policy. Look. Okay. To be fair, when you take into consideration what Americans know. What do Americans know? It doesn't matter if it's the president or, 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 or a member of, of Congress or it's somebody running for, for school board or just somebody, you know, uh, who's not a politician, right? Mm -hmm. What do we know about Israel? What Americans know about that part of the world is, is, is leads Americans to support Israel no matter what. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a little bit of, you know, shift in the, in the margins, but basically speaking, Nobody learns about Palestine. Everybody learns about Israel and a lot. The mm -hmm. Holocaust, the creation of Israel, Exodus, Megazodus, all this kind of stuff. It's heavily, heavily ingrained everywhere mm -hmm. in education, in the media, in culture, in mu mu movies, in, I mean, everywhere, in the press, in uh, philanthropy. I mean, everywhere, mm -hmm. everywhere. There's so many pro-Zionist uh, nonprofits in America that, I, I, you know, people would not believe if they, you know, I mean, how many there are in every state, in every city and so on. In our elections, as APAC is spending a hundred million dollars to unseat lib so-called liberal yeah. Democrats. And on top of that, you've got that. So mm -hmm. that's like on top of that. Right. So what do we expect Americans to know? And, 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 you know, so then somebody comes up and says, we have to boycott the only Jewish state. Well, you've got to be anti-Semitic to say that. Somebody says we need to have a single democracy with equal rights on from the river to the sea. People say, well, what about the Jewish state? Do you want to eliminate the Jewish state? You know, there's no context to understand that it's apartheid, even though Amnesty International provided a, a, an excellent report over two years ago 
mm-hmm. that there was that part the crime of apartheid is being perpetrated there's you know there, there's no no talk about that there's no understanding that there was a Palestine that was tolerant. There was a Palestine where Jews and others lived. Of course, with, with Palestinians and Jews lived together. There's no mm-hmm. context. So mm-hmm. there's no understanding. So obviously, nothing's going to change unless we fill that gap. And to be honest, I'll just say, you know, real quick, we're working on an initiative here in Washington, D.C. that, you know, to, to, to remedy that. It's going to take some time, but at least we're going to try so without change that is systemic and deep and well st- and, and, and as a, a, is based on a solid strategy, we're not going to resolve this and things are going to go better and better for Israel and far and even worse for Palestinians, if anybody can imagine that. That's the only change. That, that, those are only two options. I don't see a third option. Miko Pellet, again, I know uh, you've got an awful lot to do. You were so gracious with your time. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And look forward to look forward to uh, other conversations, and hopefully uh, they'll be under under better terms. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, my friend. Folks, what can I say? Uh, thank you to to Miko Pellet for uh, for his time with me today. Uh, thank you all so much for listening to the Connecting the Dots podcast. I'm Dr. Wilmer Leon. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. Also. Uh, please follow, please subscribe, go to Patreon. You can go to patreon.com, Wilmer Leon. Please contribute. This isn't cheap, y'all. Leave a review and share the show. Follow us on social media. You can find all the links to the show below in the description. And remember, this is where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge because talk without analysis is just chatter and we don't chatter on connecting the dots. See you next time. Until then, I'm Dr. Wilmer Leon. Peace. Have a good one. Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge.